All right, so we have a new author. So we're going to do our poll like we always do. See how you liked him and in issues you encountered when you were reading him. So any tens for Boober? Ten, it was magnificent, amazing. No. Okay, nine, eight, ah, seven. Ah, oh, Gary, maybe, Duran, okay, six, five, here come the haters, which is all of you almost, <laughs> four, oh, Greer, Gallagher, three, <laughs> oh, no, wrong challenge, <laughs> two, oh, Gonzalez, okay, one, okay, start with the haters, so let's start with Gonzalez, and then maybe Ram Charan. <laughs> Um, I was just explaining to Greer in the breakout group that I feel like a lot of times these philosophers are so versed in, in talking about these philosophical concepts and so well versed in semantically breaking down the language and utilizing it to their will and whim that they're talking about these high minded concepts in a really nerdy brainy kind of way that doesn't make any sense to the layman <laughs> and i felt like much like kant boober was very much like that as well um you probably read it in my in my homework professor it, it just didn't make any sense reading it on the first go and i read every single sentence twice sometimes three times just to try to discern exactly what he was talking about i felt like for a lot of these authors professor the the video the the youtube video ahead of class doesn't do enough justice to try to break down what exactly it is that we're reading and understanding it's only after the examination that we go through in the class and maybe even sometimes not even then do you really sort of get a conceptualization of what it is that these guys are talking about i personally have to go to wikipedia at every author and like try to figure out exactly what the hell these guys are talking about Okay, good. Yeah. Let me respond to that briefly, then we can go to Ramcharan. So two, two things, right, with regards to why these authors write like this, right? So first of all, I call this course a study abroad course for a reason, right? We are really traveling in time and space. So a lot of these authors are not writing in English, right, originally. They're not from our culture. They're not even from our epoch, right? So there is this whole language barrier, generational time barrier, right? So which is normal, right? We have to, in order to really meet these people, we're going to have these barriers for sure, right? So when Buber is writing um, in you know, he's writing in German, he's writing in the early 20th century in Europe, right? So it's a different reality than ours. Uh, people read different things, right? So to his contemporaries, he's probably actually pretty clear, <laughs> right? Because they are, they have read the same things he has read and so forth, right? So there's this language barrier, cultural barrier with all of the authors, right? Other reason why these books are difficult, right, is inherent to the discipline of philosophy, right? I think at the very first lecture I gave, I talked about that, how philosophers are not talking about the physical realm, right? They're talking about mystery, about something that is hidden, something that is not visible to the eyes, right? And, and yet they're using language, right, which is normally adapted only to the physical realm. So they're trying to talk about something which you cannot talk about. When you want to tr talk about the thou, right, or the you, how are you going to talk about this mystery, right? And so they, they in a way struggle to say what they're sensing, right? And we struggle with them, right? So, so they, these are the two main reasons, of course, why you will have, why most of us struggle with these texts. The time, the language barrier, right? The, the, spatial temporal barriers right and then of course the discipline of philosophy right so um and and by the way uh, gonzalez you seem shocked that you cannot understand right away but when you read a textbook of physics or a textbook of biology it does i am sure you're not as outraged when you do not understand right away what is there correct you know what i actually know professor i find i'm i don't consider myself uh, an incredibly intelligent person but I, I think that I'm kind of sharp. I know that with mathematics, with biology, with, uh, with chemistry, with physics, the, the discipline is there. And, and all you have to do is start at the very beginning to sort of understand it. 
what these guys are doing though is playing with this metaphysical world that for lack of a better way to sort of argue it or describe it doesn't really exist it exists in a con in a concept in our mind i find that when you're describing those kinds of things you have to kind of i hate to curse here but make stuff up and I feel like these guys are making stuff up all the time. Maybe that is because I lack the training and the tutelage that they have that they have garnered over their lives. Uh, it is obvious that these men are intelligent, uh, that these people, excuse me, are intelligent. But I find that they're kind of they're they're I don't know I don't want to say BSing this stuff, but that they're they're talking about something that has no no tangible tether in the reality. Of the universe absolutely right and and this brings us back to what i said about plato right we are beings that are caught between two realities the physical and the metaphysical reality we have this dual citizenship right now in our civilization we're used to thinking of only the physical realm we are a civilization of technology of science right um and so we're not used to talking or exploring the metaphysical realm like the ancients were for instance right so this is kind of new for us you're right it, it doesn't feel tangible it doesn't feel real it is it is real but in another way than the physical realm right and it's 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 difficult for us if because we are so used to just delving into the material realm we're very our civilization is very material right to even begin the exploration so you make really interesting point uh, gonzalez right when when you show your discomfort, right, with this reality. We have not really been taught as a civilization to explore this reality as ancient civilizations have. So we're not comfortable, right? Does that make sense? Um, another thing I wanted to say, ah, what was it? It just left my brain. Ooh. To what she said, um, oh my God, I feel like my brain is melting in the heat in the summer. Um, I'll just, it'll come back. <laughs> so does that make uh, sense, Gonzalez? So yes, you're right. It doesn't feel real, uh, but it is, but on another level, right? And oh, I, it came back, sorry. So you mentioned, right, that with physics, biology, you would have, you could start at the basics and build up, right? And it would make sense. And, and this is perhaps the problem with philosophy, the way it's taught in the United States. We start philosophy in college and right away with advanced materials with no prerequisites, right, and so forth. So had you had philosophy, like you had physics in high school, even elementary school, like we're supposed to, you would be comfortable with these concepts, right? So not only, so not only are we not really teaching philosophy until college, so we're not ready, but even in the philosophy department, there are no prerequisites for different classes. So you're thrown right away into advanced literature, right, without going through so you're right. Yes, I, I understand. Totally understand your discomfort, uh, Gonzalez. Does, does that answer a little bit uh, your, your question? Definitely. And, and I, felt the, I felt that that was exactly the answer before you described it. I, uh, I still feel like much of this metaphysical world that we're discussing, though, came from a time and a place, like you described, where we hadn't done the deliberate the um what's the right word when um the, the the scientific advancement that we have today i believe that much of our world is as grounded in the 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 physical aspect of the universe because we have moved away from that when you look at the numbers of people who no longer believe in the existence of god it, it just goes to show that i feel like our species is moving away from the metaphysical yeah you're right and and that's why it feels a bit unnatural unless you have some religious yeah. background right but if you don't it's like what the hell is going on here what is he talking about right Aguirre, exactly. do, you to, do you want to add to hey okay so um i just want to add it's like i'm just piggybacking off of him the way he said people are moving away from religion and stuff like that i agree i like i said before i had philosophy in high school because I went to a Catholic school, so it was part of our curriculum. We had to take a class like similar to this, but very basic, touching the skim of it. I feel, if anything, pushing the faith like that, or pushing any faith, because I grew up Catholic now, I'm atheist, but pushing any faith drives someone away from it. So I feel like now that I'm in college, I'm 
I willingly took this class as my one of my electives. It's not like it was forced onto me. Like it kind of was in high school as I had to take four years of religion and philosophy and all these other like religious courses, community service, all that stuff. Like that's good, but at the same time, it's like you're forming a young mind to end up wanting to, I feel, rebel against the church. Good. Uh, yeah, good point. Um, I just want to clarify something, though, to, we need to distinguish very carefully between the metaphysical and the religious, right? Buber is not doing religion. He's doing ethics, right? We're going to see that. He's talking about human beings, how they relate, right? There is no, I mean, he does talk about God, but we're not focusing on that section, right? So he's not doing religion here. He's doing metaphysics or ethics more specifically, actually, ethics, because he's not even talking about some alternative reality like Plato. He's talking about the realm of human relations. And he's saying within this realm, there is a dimension of mystery that we need to begin to protect, right? So, which is typical of existentialist philosophers. I, I don't know if you remember my lecture on Kierkegaard, right? When I say that existentialism is going back to life and finding the transcendent within life, not trying to escape life to find it, right? So he's kind of part of this movement, right? He's finding the transcendent, the mystery that's, you know, within our relationships, he's finding that. But it's not religion, right? I want to be really clear about that. Okay, good. Let's have a lover. Uh, who were our lovers? Uh, who was it? And manifest yourself. I have forgotten who you were because my brain is melting in the heat. Um, if you were a lover, raise your hand and we will let you speak as to why you liked uh, the text. I think Duran was a lover, correct? I was, um, yeah, and not completely a 10, more like a 7 professor. Um, and my reasons why I, I rated it as a 7 is because a little bit like Gonzalez said, yes, it was um, a little bit, um, I, I had to reread definitely a few times but once i did reread it, i was able to get like valuable information like yes it required work definitely a little bit more difficult to read not because it was difficult to read as like you know it's just the language you know what i mean and also what i felt that i personally what i grasped from it was more that there's value in the individual and it, this and that it's revealed amongst our relationship with other people. Like, that's what I perceive for it. Yes, it took me a while to get to it, but I did. Like, that's why it's a seven. Very good, right? So you guys have to get used to seeing these texts as a treasure hunt. Don't, don't go, remember I told you, don't go to these texts with the expectation that you will understand. Otherwise you will get frustrated, right? It's, you cannot understand these texts. <laughs> so I'll say it straight up. You cannot understand these texts by yourselves, right? Um, most professors, I mean, often, they give you some summary, right? Most professors don't make you read the actual text. I do, right? Why? Because I want you to encounter these people, right? But I'm aware that they're way further, right? But it's just, I want you to experience it, right? Don't expect to understand anything. Expect simply to be inspired, challenged, right? Enjoy being inspired and challenged. Enjoy not understanding, right? See, have more of a spirit, maybe of curiosity, adventure, right? And then, of course, if you're worried about the test, obviously, I will explain what needs to be understood, right? But as you read, I want you to have a different attitude. Like, don't, don't go there thinking, yeah, why are they clear? And why are they, you know, <laughs> what's their problem? You know, go there knowing it's going to be sophisticated, complex, right? because they're talking about something sophisticated and complex and, and just enjoy being around them, right? You're sitting at the table, eavesdropping on great conversations, right? Um, and it's okay not to understand, right? I know in, in, in our culture, we're a democratic culture, right? We think everything should be equal <laughs> and accessible, but life is not like that, right? Many things are hidden, many things are, you know, high up right and and it does take a struggle and and um and i guess uh, a spirit of you know kind of adventure to get to certain things we are not all going to reach the same place it depends on you right so in that sense right i want you to have a more of a spirit of adventure when you're looking at these texts and less a spirit of uh i don't know whatever you have so far <laughs> okay i see a question did i see a question no. All right, let's get in the text, um, see what we can get out of it. So, um, 
Yeah. Today, I'm going to focus on the IU. We're going to understand what that means, or IDAO. I'm using them, uh, I'm switching. It's the same thing. IU, IDAO. Okay, I'm sometimes switching around. Okay, so um, let's begin. I'm gonna, we're going to look at this together on page 55. And because this is kind of poetic, right, a lot of you noticed that it was kind of closer to poetry than to, like, you know, philosophical reasoning. There's no reasoning here, <laughs> right? It's all, like, kind of um, almost like he's writing in a trance, right? It's very mystical, very poetic. So kind of like Rumi. Right? There are a lot of connections between Buber and Rumi. So what I want us to do today is, again, we're going to work together on the text, like we did for Rumi. Uh, we're going to work together also. I'm going to read a passage, and you're going to tell me what do you think it means, right? And we're going to build together the meaning of, of these passages. And by the end, hopefully, some of you, or if not all, will be a little more reconciled <laughs> with Buber. So, okay, page 55, we're focusing on the you. The I, it, we know already, right? The I, it is what Kant talked about, right? Uh, I, it is treating someone like an object, which is how most of our relationships are, right? Most of us, when we relate to each other, it is in order to get something out of the person, right? This is a default, natural way we relate. It takes a little bit of sophistication to get to the I, you, right? But naturally, as human beings, natural default attitude is I, it. I see you, you're cute, I I'm going to want to be your friend or your lover, right? Because you're going to bring me X, Y, Z, right? Or I'm, uh, uh, or an employer is looking for me, they don't care about me, they care about what I have to offer to the company, right? Or you go, I don't know, you, you, you need something done, right? Again, a person will give you a service, right? So most of our relationships, right? Even the most intimate ones, like, like romantic love or family and so forth, is guided by the I, it, right? Most of us relate to people because there's something in it for us, right? Even we are respectful to our parents because ultimately there's something in it for us, right? Or we're nice to our sister that we loathe because there is something in it for us, eventually, some, somewhere down the line. Or we fall in love with this person because we sense they can bring us this or that, right? Natural default. Um, <clears throat> now, Buber is saying if we stay on that level, we will have very uh, one-dimensional relationships, right? The relationship will not be rich, will not be full, will not be profound, right? We need to also be able to develop or, or um, um, cultivate IU relationships, right? So we have to look at this because we're not used to it. This is a new way of relating and he's going to describe it on page 55 and we're going to together go and see what that looks like, right? All right. So I'm starting on page 55. Are you all with me? Put your hand in the screen if you're there, whoever says you. Okay. All right. So begins, sounds just like Kant, right? Whoever says you does not have something for his object. What is he saying? <laughs> What does this mean? Whoever has you does not have something for his object. Translation, please. <clears throat> okay, Sarkeesian, go ahead. Could it be because like now suddenly they're putting the focus on like the subject of the conversation is someone else, like an actual, like it's about a human being? Right, what does it mean to, have, to treat someone like an object? You can just ask yourself. What does it mean to treat someone like an object? You kind of just like use them and don't really consider them in the first place to begin a sentence with them, really. Okay, very good. Right, so we're in Kant territory, right? Remember, Buber is starting with Kant. He starts out talking a lot like Kant, then he goes a little deeper. So yes, treating someone like an object, you use them or you discard them. Examples, right? You, you, you know, you have a friend for their car, right? You, make, you don't like this person, but they have a car, right? Or you ghost someone. Have you ever thought of ghost, how, what, how ghosting someone might be treating someone like an object, right? You disappear. You were on Tinder, right? You were talking, and then you got sick of it. <laughs> and so you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm ghosting this person. I'm not even going to say goodbye, nothing. And you just kind of disappear, vanish, right? This is discarding, right? Like an object. Oh, I'm done with this object. Let me throw it away, <laughs> right? We're very casual. Very casually, we are engaging in a multiplicity of I it relationships on all levels, right? Ghosting is an I it relationship. Um, going out with someone because we just, 
you know, for now, I, I've heard this. This is a great one. Like, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to date this person. It's not the one, but I'm going to date them because for now it's good. Right. <laughs> right? We're, again, right. Sinking into the, I'm going to use this person for a while. And then when I'm done, when the one comes, what are you going to do with them? Well, discard them, obviously. Right. So this, we have this mentality of I'm going to take and discard, take and discard. This is a pure I it, right? I you, you abstain, right? This is pure Kant, right? I will not take you and I will not discard you, right? I'm going to abstain from that culture, right? So that now you're, if you do this, you're already opening up slowly the dimension of the IU. Karuchi. Professor, yeah, it, what I don't understand fully is the, uh, the phrase, whoever says you. Um, yeah. So when you address someone as a you, or when you see them as a you, not as an it, then you do not have them as your object. So he's just saying, when he says whoever okay. says you, it's a poetic way to say whenever you encounter someone as a you, and not as an it, that's how you treat them, right? That's how you behave in their presence. So it's poetic, right? Says you simply saying whoever addresses a you, whoever encounters a you. Makes sense, uh, Karuchi? Okay. Uh, okay, so we got that one. That one is pretty simple. We studied it already with Kant. We're good now. Here's the next one. I'm going down a few lines. Uh, wave at me when you're there. The you has no borders. Did you find it? Put your hand in the screen. Okay, the you has no, has no borders. Okay, let's stop on that a little bit. It's interesting. So you has no borders. You do not have a border. So what does it mean to put borders on people, right? How are some ways that we put borders on each other? thereby missing the you of that person. Tell me, let's have some examples of how we put borders on each other, contain each other, thereby missing the you. Uh, Gonzalez, go ahead. Uh, in another sense, it's kind of like labeling people, mm -hmm. uh, labeling them heterosexual, homosexual, labeling them Republican, Democrat. Yes, Assume, any label, any label is dangerous according to Buber, right? Because you miss the whole richness of the person. I mean, have you ever been like sitting in a group of people, right? And, you, and you're in a great conversation with the person next to you and all of a sudden you find out they're a Republican or a Democrat, depending on where you are. And now all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, you know? <laughs> it's like, why am I even talking to this person, right? Your whole view changes. All of a sudden you have now reduced them to this caricature of what you think a Republican looks like and a Dem or a Democrat looks like, right? So all of a sudden, there's a chill. <laughs> there's a coldness that invades your being, right? So any label, labels of race, right? This is why, I mean, you know, it's funny how here I, I was, I'm always so shocked the way that we cut people up in races in this country um, and the way it, you have to fill up little boxes, you know, about your race. And the way we talk about each other, right? That black person, this Latino, this, um, this is, I mean, coming from Europe, this is so frightening to me, right? Because this is for us in, in Europe, when we start to break up our, our um, countries and races, this is the beginning of genocide. Happened in Germany, happened in Yugoslavia, happened in Rwanda. As soon as you start to, to, to divide the society in different races, you have, you're, you have the perfect setup. Right, for a genocide. So the way we so casually engage in this country in racial, um, not even stereotyping, right, just racial discourse, right, is frightening to me <laughs> and to Boober, I'm sure, right? It is not innocent to go around dividing people by race, right? We need to find a different uh, way of talking about people. I know it's easier to just say that black guy over there or this white girl over here, <laughs> but, but there is something inherently problematic in reducing someone to the color of their skin, right? There's nothing else you notice about that person, just the color of their skin, right? That's the only way you can identify them. Um, I would give you the exercise when you go back in your life, right, after this class, and you want to point someone out in a crowd and you're tempted to just say the color, try to find other characteristics <laughs> you know, that you can point them out with, right? It's, it's problematic, right? The way, the way we distinguish, categorize people, 
right? And the way we stereotype, so even beyond categorizing, right? Now this is the real problem, this stereotyping, right? Asian women are like this, black men are like that, right? Latino women are like this. And then we, we, bah, we have imprisoned each other in our race, in our class, in our sex, right? And we can't get out. You're a woman, therefore you should be like this. You're a man, therefore you should do this and this and this in this relationship, right? We'll talk about these roles, right? Gender roles in the next class, right? Or, you know, you're Latino, you're supposed to, you know, you're French, why don't you, you know? <laughs> so that's the idea, right? So excellent, Gonzalez. First way that we miss the you is by categorizing, not even stereotyping, just categorizing and, and kind of reducing that person to that category. And everything now that they say, you're sticking that category on it and you're missing the richness of the person, right? Um, so that's the first thing. Okay, Karuchi, other ways that we border each other. <laughs> oh, that was uh, an extended raised hand. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay, let's see. There's I, I'm just nodding at what you're saying because you're okay. right. Let's see. Mustafa said, "Set boundaries like what you can." Oh, good, Mustafa. Go ahead. Tell us what. Tell us more about what you're saying in the chat. <clears throat> Mustafa, you there? Where's Mustafa? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just trying to say, like, some people need to set limits. Um, for example, like, if you don't like going to a certain place, you can tell the other person like, hey, I don't like going to a certain place. Or if you don't want someone to talk to another person, be like, hey, um, I don't feel comfortable with you speaking with the other person. But yeah, that's what I meant. Like, so you're talking about boundaries, right? Be careful. He's not talking about boundaries. This boundary oh. is good. Borders <laughs> is bad, right? <laughs> So boundaries is something positive that we put around ourselves, right, um, to be respected, like Kant was suggesting, right? Make sure people respect you. He, this is a border. This is bad, right? This is borders that we put on other people. So Mustafa, do you want to try and think about another way that we put a border on people? I mean, what you said in the chat actually made sense in, in the way I was thinking it. <laughs> try, okay, I'll let you think about it. Uh, Karuchi, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, what I was going to say, uh, and it's kind of what Mustafa was, uh, um, at least what I implied from what she wrote, is that uh, we value people based, uh, or we put um, borders on people based on what their value is to us. Um, so in other words, what can I use you for? What are you good for? Is, uh, you know, almost in a, in a resource type way, you know. Um, so I think, you know, that's the way we look at it. Good, absolutely, right? We we reduce the person to what their value for us and we miss everything else, right? Or we limit them. That's what I was reading into Mustafa's. So how are some ways, now even thinking within romantic love, right? How are some ways that we limit each other? I'm curious. Thereby missing the you, right? How are some ways in a relationship that you start to limit uh, your partner? Gonzalez. Uh, one way is of having of an expectation that one partner in the relationship is going to provide something or do something for the relationship. Well, you're the wife. You're traditionally supposed to cook and clean. Well, I'm, I'm the husband. I'm so tr traditionally supposed to go out and work and bring the money home. Yes. And, and that, that limits our, our ability to fulfill whatever it is that we want to fulfill in our lives. Very good, right? The, the roles that we give each other, right? Well, you're a woman, therefore. You're a man, therefore, right? You're, um, so yes, absolutely. So one way of limiting the other is asphyxiating, imprisoning them in a role, right? Very good. What's another way that we limit each other? These are those borders, right? What's another way that we limit each other? Uh, Karuchi, is that a new hand or is that an old hand? <laughs> old, okay. All right, I'm listening. What are some other ways we limit each other? Uh, you should be thinking of Kierkegaard. Uh, he talked about a way that we can limit each other um, and a way also that we can liberate each other. Anybody can make the connection here between Kierkegaard and Buber, what we learned in Kierkegaard's second lecture and what Buber is saying here. Uh, okay, Kanai says, um, okay, so yeah, so this is not Kierkegaard, but this, this works, <laughs> right? When you want to control your partner, right? Oh, you should be, uh, and I think Gonzalez mentioned expectations, right? Well, you know, you, 
uh, don't do it like that. Don't wear that, right? Don't go there. Don't eat like that. Don't eat that, <laughs> right? Um, my, my father is always doing that to my mom. Like, stop eating. You're getting fat. <laughs> you know? So the ways that, the, the multiple ways that we control each other in a relationship. Oh, surely you don't want to study that. I, I think you should become a doctor, not a painter. What are you going to do painting, <laughs> right? Or I think, you know, I don't think you should wear that. That doesn't look good on you. Or, you know, I... Uh, and so we have so many ways when we try to give each other advice and, and change each other, right? These are all borders, right? As soon as you start, as soon as you have a vision how the other should be, according to what you think, boom, you've put a border, right? You've encapsulated them in your vision. So any form of control in a relationship is placing a border and prisoning them in your representation of who they should be in your vision of who they should be, right? And so now they cannot be fully themselves, right? They wanted to pursue a career in, I don't know, rollerblading, and you kind of, you know, you ruined that for them, right? So, and maybe you had good reasons, and I'm sure you did, and I probably would have sided with you, right? But you've missed by doing so, by trying to control them and, and change them, you have missed the you in the relationship and you have missed the profundity of the relationship. Um, remember, make a difference between trying to change someone and creating the conditions of possibility of change. Kierkegaard is about creating the conditions for change. You hope and the person themselves begin to change. Here, right, you tell them you need to change this and this and this for me, <laughs> right? You see that, does everybody see the difference between trying to change someone and allowing someone to change. Do you see the difference between the two? Put your hand in the screen if you're following, right? So in, in Kierkegaard, we don't tell them to change. We create the space for them to change, right? If they choose to. Here, do you need to change for me. You need to wear that. You need to become that. You need to make this much money. You need to cook this how many times a day, <laughs> right? For me, that's what I need. And now you have imprison them in your expectations, right? The way that we imprison each other in our expectations. But we're still missing the main point with Kierkegaard. The last, what was the second uh, class on Kierkegaard about? <laughs> See if you remember. Can't believe some of you have to look at your notes. No, it wasn't respect, can I? That was Kant. <laughs> no, Shia, that was Kant. Where were you guys for Kierkegaard? <laughs> I feel like I was talking about myself. <laughs> Duran, <laughs> help us. Um, you can't put love to shame. Right before that, what did I talk about? <laughs> Same lecture. Um, sources of eternal love. Sorry, I'm just going off the top of my head. <laughs> no, that's not the answer I'm looking for. What was the main, con the main uh, topic of the second lecture of Kierkegaard? Don't do, oh. do not disappoint me like this. Thank you, yeah. hope, yes. Now, when you hope, are you putting a border or are you taking off a border? How would you connect hope to what Boober is saying here? <clears throat> are your brains melting like mine? Is that it? Is that it? Is it too hot? It's too hot for me. So, okay, so let, let me help you, okay? Ah, here's a couple people in the chat. All right, uh, when we lose hope, we limit love. Okay, good, Karachi. And then when you hope your partner to be better, you put a border on what they should or should not do. Oh, almost, Sha. Remember, Sha, it's different, right, from telling your partner to change. The kind of hope in Kierkegaard is about creating the space for them to change. Um, so, Karachi, do you want to elaborate and explain what you meant in the chat? Yeah, so... Um... I didn't get a chance. I, I wasn't <clears throat> here live for the second uh, Kierkegaard lecture and I haven't listened to all of it, but um, I, I think when we lose hope in um, the relationship or uh, lose hope in our partners, um, <clears throat> I think that then we limit love because sometimes it's hard to get past that, right? So let's just say that there was a crisis in the relationship or uh, we were hurt by our beloved or there's a wound that's created. If we're not able to drop that and keep hope, you know, that uh, there's still love there, this love can grow, uh, we can, you know, continue to move forward, then um, 
you know, the relationship is going to die on the vine, so to speak. Good. Yes, that's that's the idea. And Jaeger, you are right on, right? Hope takes off. So let me elaborate on what you said, Karuchi, based on Jaeger, right? Hope takes off the border, right? Despair puts on a border. Despair says you're never going to change. You're always going to be like this. You've cheated, you'll cheat again. You've lied, you'll lie again. And this is a natural despair is again, same as the I it default. We are more, it's easier for us to despair than to hope, right? When someone has done us wrong, automatically we deduce that they will do us wrong again. And by doing that, boom, border. See, you did that, now you're gonna do it again, Bath. you've imprisoned them in their past self, right? Whereas hope poof, explodes the border and says, you did this before, but I'm taking off. You can be anything now. You could be the most faithful person in the world, or not, I don't know, <laughs> right? But I'm taking off the border. I'm allowing you to become something else than your past self, right? That's hope. And when you hope, you are now connecting to the other person as a you. You are revealing their you. You are um, cultivating a IU relationship at that moment when you hope. Does everybody follow clearly what I said with hope and the connection with the IU? Okay, anyone need a clarification? Always stop me, right? When you want me to repeat something because I go very fast. Yeah, okay. can you repeat that for me, Professor? <laughs> yes, sure. Okay, when you despair, you put a border. Despair says what you were, you will be again. You are imprisoning the person in their past self, right? That's despair. Let me write it in the chat, right? Despair, you imprison the person in their past self. Hope, you release them from the past self. They could be anything you don't know right no borders <laughs> no limits to what they could become right so in that sense right we have a connection here between what Uber is saying and Kant hope is the ultimate IU relationship when you foster a relationship of hope towards the other you are engaging in an IU relationship right automatically excellent okay good now let's go to the next one continuing down that paragraph right uh, next line, whoever has you, or sorry, sorry, whoever says you does not have something, he has nothing. So what does it mean now that when you're with a person and you're treating them like a you, you have nothing? This sounds terrible. What does it mean you're getting nothing? <laughs> Can anyone interpret this terrifying line? What does it mean to be in a relationship where you have nothing? That doesn't sound very appealing. <laughs> uh, Duran, go ahead. Does it mean something like being selfless? Yeah, you're not in the relationship to get something, right? And even when there is nothing, you're good, <laughs> right? So it's not a transaction, basically what he's saying here. We're going back to this thing we studied in Rumi, right? Most of us, we are in transactional relationships. I give you something, I get something. What is this nothing? <laughs> I give you something and you give me nothing? What kind of relate? right? And, and Buber is saying, you're not expecting something in an IU relationship. It's not about getting something, right? It's not a transaction. You stand in, and then he says, when you are in that uh, attitude of um, having nothing or getting nothing out of it, you stand in relation. At that moment, you have reached a level of relationship versus the level of transaction, right? That's the idea here. So another, this is an idea that we can, uh, that we heard already in, in Rumi. Okay, now we're going to skip. There's a couple more uh, passages on the IU. I want you to go to page 62. And you'll, you're going to find Rumi there also. Okay, this whole paragraph is really beautiful, the top paragraph. I mean, I almost want to read the whole thing. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, everybody there, the you encounters me. Put your hand in the screen if you're there. Okay. The you encounters me by grace. It cannot be found by seeking. Okay, what does it mean that a person, right, um, that a you, right, a relationship where you're engaging with a you can only happen by grace, that you cannot seek out an IU relationship? 
life. You cannot make it happen. What does that mean? You should think of Rumi, that, that would help you. Uh, Sarkeesian. I'm not sure if I can recall Rumi that well for him to guide me on this one, but just like trying to like guess, I suppose, in a way. Um, the way it seems to, the way, what it seems to mean to me is basically, um, you can't, like, for example, right, like, if you want to choose friends or something, right, you can't really just, like, walk up to anyone and have it in your mind, right, like, oh, I'm going to be, like, best friends with this person, right, because you might not necessarily like anyone that much, do you know what I mean? Like, you can try to force yourself to, but at the end of the day, you won't feel that connection like you would actually feel if it was a genuine thing that just, like, naturally happened, right, like, where you develop that kind of a meaningful relationship. Right, excellent, right, that's the idea. You can't make... A relationship happened. That's what he's saying here. You, I mean, you can, and it will be an I it relationship, right? There's plenty of relationships you can make happen, but it's never gonna go deeper than the I it, right? You can make this person date you. You can make them marry you. You can make them like you, but it's never gonna be the relationship. You, there's never gonna be that depth where you're not in control, right? So. Absolutely, right? The, the true, the authentic relationships happen to us, right? The true relationships that are deep and, and meaningful, we cannot make them happen. You cannot control this whole dimension of relationships, right? This is the tough truth we are learning in this class, right? We cannot control this. We can create the right conditions, right? But we cannot control. And so to give up the control, I'm not going to force you to love me. I'm not going to force you to date me. I'm not going to manipulate you into sleeping with me, right? Now we are in the IU relationship. When you realize it's a grace, it comes to me. I cannot seduce that person. I cannot manipulate them. I cannot control them. Um, by the way, I know you're all, I, I, I don't want to give publicity to that book, but there's a very famous book called The Art of Seduction right now. It's a book written for men. I see a bunch of people reading it in the men, <laughs> reading it in the subway, in the in the uh, in, in the bus, and so forth. And it's all about power, right? This is uh, this is where we are. When we want to learn to seduce, we want to have power over the person. We want to find a way to kind of like lure them into our lives, right? Any type of seduction like that, right? Not like the one we talked about in the Song of Songs, right? Any type of seduction which is based in forging a relationship where you have power over the other in some way, manipulating the other in some way. You are now already in the I it, right? Um, the women's version of this is the rules. <laughs> How to uh, get someone to marry you in six months. <laughs> I mean, these books are good, really good advice, uh, honestly. I have to say, both of these books, right? The one, How to Seduce Women, right? How to, and the one, How to Get the Man to Marry You in Six Months. Great advice. <laughs> I recommend it. But the only issue with all of these books that we have right now in the literature, right? When you go to Barnes and Nobles, when you go to any bookstore and you have these books on how to attract commitment, how to attract the man in six months, how to attract the woman in six months, right? All of this is based on something you do, power, right? And what we're learning here is that any attempt at controlling, right, is leading you straight into the I-8 relationship, right? The, you can, the only thing you can do, that's what we're learning in the class, is create the space, create the environment, right? This we can do, but you cannot make the thing happen, right? And any time you try to make the thing happen, boom, you fall in the eye it. You're already sinking, right? The, the you happens by grace. It will come to you. It will enter your life without you controlling it, right? Gonzalez, go ahead. Professor, when we studied Rumi uh, in the poem, Any Sprig of an Herb, we had discussed how we create our own obstacles in the course of love by trying to control it. Yes. Right? So these are the borders that we create, that we put up on people, that they get in the way of us establishing a closer relationship with one another. Oh, this is so well put, right? We, we put these borders, right, or we put these expectations. Often in a relationship, we have these expectations we want our lover to fulfill because we think it will bring us deeper intimacy, right? And actually, it's actually a big obstacle to intimacy. The moment you relinquish control over your beloved is the moment you're creating a path for intimacy. As long as you're trying to control this, no intimacy, 
It's obstacle after obstacle. Very well put, uh, Gonzalez, right? So if you really want to create a path for intimacy, right? Learn to relinquish control over everything. <laughs> you can create the space for change, but you cannot change them, right? Uh, nor should you try, <laughs> right? Uh, this is their journey. It's their process, right? You can be there, you can create the environment, but you cannot push them or pull them, or <laughs> right? Mold them or fashion them, right? You're not the creator. So that's what he's saying, right? If you want an IU relationship, an authentic, intimate relationship, you have to give up the control and enter the state of grace, right? As long as you're controlling, you will never know grace. And this is, this is so profound, right? Because we want sometimes, we need the relationship to evolve or change or mature or grow and it's stuck, right? And in trying to make it happen, we miss the grace, which often happens when we relinquish control, where the change happens by itself, right? The relationship all of a sudden moves, <laughs> right? This is a state of grace where we just relinquish control, we surrender, we do our part, right? And then surrender. And then we can receive the grace of transformation, of evolution, of growth, right? Of deeper intimacy. Deeper intimacy, you cannot make it happen. You can allow it to happen. That's all you can do or create the conditions of possibility for it to happen. As long as you're controlling, you will miss all the grace that you could experience in the relationship, right? You have to give up control to enter the state of grace and to to witness these miracles that happen when we relinquish control right so very nicely put um, gonzalez uh so good very very nice passage right uh, echoes with rumi when he said that the, the beloved comes at midnight remember i commented that text i said midnight right when we are least active when we're most receptive and still right when we are doing nothing that is when the beloved comes, right? Um, so it doesn't mean, by the way, you just sit around and, and mope, right? You can, cre you can create the environment. It's like, I, I always, you know, y'all should do some gardening. This is, gardening is great to learn about relationships, right? You plant a, a plant, right? There's nothing you can do to make it grow. You can't go in the earth and pull it, right? Make it, you're going to make it die. But you can water it. You can fertilize it. You can put it in the sun. All these things you can do but you cannot force it to grow, <laughs> right? It's the same with relationships. There's a lot you can do. You can create the conditions, but then you, can, you have to let go. Let the plant do its thing, <laughs> right? Okay, excellent. Now here's the last quote, really beautiful, last line. I mean, next to last line. It's kind of a tongue twister. We're gonna look at it. I require a you. Are you there? Wave at me if you're there. I require a you. Okay, all right. I require a you to become. Becoming I, I say you. Okay, can anyone decipher what is going on here? It's kind of like a riddle. What is he trying to say? Can anyone translate? I require a you to become me. Becoming I, I only become myself when I say you. What's he saying? Anyone translate? It's your brave soul. <laughs> Okay, Aguirre, go ahead. I'm 100% going to get this wrong, but I'm going to try. Um, so is it like, you know, two halves make a whole, more or less? Like if you have two complete halves, it'll make the whole? Uh, almost. <laughs> I tried, almost. I tried. <laughs> because I don't know if he wants to make a whole, right? Because that sounds like Plato, where the you just fulfills you, right? The other fulfills you, then you have a com completion. Oh, okay. Yeah, like yeah. That, right? That's He's, where I was getting that from. I knew it came from somewhere. Yeah, I just yeah, yeah. didn't know where it was coming from. So we're falling into the, the, the other completes me, fulfills me, and then you're back in the I it, right? This is the problem with these three speeches. Pure I it, right? Uh, Gonzalez, help us out. <laughs> uh, when I read that, Professor, I'm thinking to myself that uh, my existence only manifests itself, only, only becomes any, something real in the context of another existence like does a does a tree that falls over in the forest make a sound kind of analogy Take those examples <laughs> that's good yeah hey gonzalez for someone who hates boober you're doing pretty good uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you professor <laughs> very nice yes absolutely right it's, it's as he's saying 
I become fully myself when I'm engaging with a you. As long as I'm engaging with a bunch of it's, I'm a stunted version of myself. If your relationships are just a bunch of I it relationships, you will never get to the full potential of who you are as a human being. You will remain a stunted version of yourself. The moment you begin to cultivate I you relationship is the moment you actually begin to blossom as a human being, right? So treating someone as a you actually makes you into a higher I, right? So in other words, we reach um, our full potential, right, as human beings only in IU relationships. Ah, oh, can't write. Right? If all of your relationships are just I-8 relationships, you'll be actually very, humanly speaking, very impoverished, right? Very one-dimensional. And, and this is the state of affairs of, in general, right? But the moment you begin to cultivate IU relationships, meaning you don't use them, you don't discard them, you're careful, right? You, res you honor their humanity, right? You don't put borders on them. You don't expect X, Y, Z from them. You don't want to control or change them. The moment you begin to really artfully cultivate these kind of relationships, you will change. Something in you will shift. You will become more profound, deeper human being, more uh, free. You're, you're going to write, uh, elevate yourself to higher uh, states of consciousness, right? So as you treat someone like a you, you also become more of an I, right? Um, does that make sense? Put your hand if you're following um, what I'm saying. Uh, Gonzalez, is that a new question or an old question? It's a, a new question. I, I have, uh, I don't know, Professor, I have a, an argument against this. Okay. It seems as if Boober is trying to say that you're not really human unless you interact and relate with other humans as humans. Yeah, that's it. You have a problem with that? <laughs> I do. I do, because what about the people that, uh, I don't know, astronauts, explorers that go out into space alone, are they not human? Are they not at the very edge of, of what it, we seem to try to be, exploring other boundaries? Uh, are they? Do they lack humanity simply because they are not in the presence of other humans? I mean, you don't have to be in the physical presence, right? The astronauts still have contact with the Earth, right? They still have relationships, they cultivate. So you don't have to be in the physical presence. You just have to have in your life these relationships, even if they're virtual, like us for a whole year, right? You can still have an IU relationship via Zoom, right? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, that makes sense. But it seems as if he's saying that you are not you unless yeah. you view yourself in the context of other people. Yes, exactly. He's saying we cannot be fully ourselves outside uh, of relationships. Relationships is what really brings us to the highest level of ourselves. This is, again, countercultural because we're taught, oh, you can reach your highest potential by studying, getting a job, a house, and a white picket fence. This is the American dream. That's how you reach your highest potential. Boober is countercultural when he says, no, your highest potential is not your house, it's your relationships. And I agree with that. I, I totally agree with that, Professor. I don't, I don't think that, our, that we should esteem to sort of collect things or, or I, I forget where they said it before, how within Western culture, we try to view our lives as we need to achieve something, we need to become something. Yeah. Uh, whereas in other, a lot of Eastern civilizations and cultures, think that simply because I'm, I'm breathing and I'm existing, that that is fruit in and of itself and that, that, that our purpose is right there to exist and to be happy. I, I don't have any problem with that kind of ideology, but I do take umbrage with the fact that he's saying that you lack humanity in the absence of other humanity. Yeah, that's what he's saying. I mean, he's not saying you're not human. He's saying you're not your highest human. <laughs> Right. I mean, okay, I, I get that interpretation, but that's not what it looks like he's saying. Yeah, no, you're right. We can, we can keep it as radical it works too. Okay, let me, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there has been some a backlash against the practice of solitary confinement, right? Um, 
there was a beautiful um, uh, lecture I heard of um, somebody uh, saying that solitary confinement, we put them there so they can reflect and become better human beings, but actually they become savages, right? Because we cut them off from people, right? So this person was arguing, not based on Buber, but based on Levinas, but uh, Buber is kind of the same. And you could have made the argument from Buber that you cannot reach, you cannot reach a better version of yourself or redemption, right, as a criminal, if you're cut off. Right? And so this whole solitary confinement is counterproductive, going in the opposite direction, right? And it's true. I mean, we know what it does to people, right, to be in solitary confinement. So this is kind of what he's saying. He's saying you cannot be truly human. Yes, I, I can go there without engaging in relationships with other humans as humans, not as objects. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what he's saying. Um, but, but what is your issue with that? <laughs> My issue with that is that it, I don't know how to, how to put, put it into words just yet. And I, I'd like to think about it a little bit more, uh, okay. maybe give you a response later. But okay. in essence, it feels as if the, it's doing away with the reality of the fact that our humanity, what we have defined as what we are, is made up of all of these individuals. I, I get that we're social creatures and that our families, our unions, our bonds with one another help create our society and they give meaning and context to our lives. But to say that your life has no meaning or no context in the absence of other human beings is to disregard your existence altogether. Uh, I think therefore I am. I, I don't know who said that, but <laughs> okay, so then it, it totally mutes that argument yes, that he, he, you are simply yeah. because you are. He is intentionally working against Descartes, right? This okay. is a backlash of existentialism against Cartesian philosophy, which says I can be fully human by myself, right? And they're saying no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. And this is very similar, actually, if you ever explore African philosophy, they have some, some similar idea where they say the human being grows through their relationships, starting with the mother, then the mentor, then the, the partner, romantic partner, and then the children, right? They say at each level, you become a higher version of yourself, right? So this is actually very um, common in, in, in the whole um, Middle Eastern and African continent to think of yourself as maturing through your relationships. And we saw this in the Song of Songs, right? Very similar to that context, African Middle Eastern, where this woman grows through the relationship. She starts out super immature, and then she becomes this more mature, you know, be able to let go and, and, and so forth. So, um, so we can see how it's not that you're not human at the base. We are humans, but uh, we are like in the egg right and the okay. relationships help us um help the egg open i don't know how to say that the egg cracks open and we become more right so okay. we're humans by ourselves but we are not fully put developed humans <laughs> i guess i would put it like that gotcha that makes a lot more sense okay good i'm glad that clarified that good sarkeesian sorry you've been waiting <laughs> I think it's possible that I might be misinterpreting this as well, right? But I almost wonder, I think the astronaut thing um, Gonzalez mentioned earlier might be the perfect example because like even outside of the existence of like Zoom, right? Let's say they really were out there alone by themselves, right? And they couldn't really contact until they came back, right? I think when you consider astronauts, right? Like someone like doing that like thing, going all the way out there, and I'm not necessarily saying this from the perspective of like self-sacrifice, right? It's not they're necessarily going to die or something just because they go out there, even though obviously, right, like there have been more than enough accidents even recently, right? That like it's always a bit of a risk. It's kind of like I imagine there might be some minority of astronauts or people in those kinds of positions that kind of do it for the status, right? That like material world kind of focus, right? Where you're like, oh, I just want to use people around me, use this position as like an object, right? Exploit and like get myself seen as higher right but at the same time i imagine most astronauts are probably doing it on some like metaphysical basis do you know what i mean not necessarily any specific relationships but just like the idea as well right of like my relationship let's say to humanity right or my relationship in general to the world where by doing this like i can kind of like further everyone else and that's kind of their basis do you know what i mean it's like even if they're not interacting with any objects in in any situation 
I think Boober might also be saying, right, like, even if it's not a specific person, as so- soon as you start seeing an entity as something besides just an object to exploit and throw away, you're also still practicing becoming a full human. I yeah, think. yeah. <clears throat> he mentions, I think, I don't know if you guys read the example of the tree, right? So, yes, you can view God, right, as a you, or the universe as a you, right? The cosmos, nature as a you. The moment you forge an IU relationship, even if it's with the universe or with nature, right? Something that we would learn, it would really benefit us to learn to do that when it comes to nature, right? To see nature as a you and not as an it <laughs> that we can overexploit until it shrivels up and dies, right? So, uh, yes, absolutely. If you can also, if you're right, you can cultivate IU relationships with non human entities. I, I agree with you. Um, because for, for Buber, right, the life of the spirit, and I think he mentions it further down in the book, if you read the whole book, he talks about this, right, is something that is relational and you can relate to even nature in that way. So yeah, I, I would agree with you. So yes, the, I mean, yes, the astronaut lost in the universe can still have an IU relationship with the cosmos and in that sense not lose their humanity, right? Or like people like Thoreau who went to a nature in a forest for, a, I don't know how long, a year or so didn't see a soul and yet you can see the depth of what they you know this guy right Walden Pond um, okay, look him up this is American philosophy <laughs> right this is a guy this is a famous American author right who went and lived by himself in a forest and then he wrote about his experience and didn't see a single human being right this is for you Gonzalez no human being but you can but he, he, he there was such a wealth in his experience because he was cultivating an IU relationship with nature, right? So, so yeah, thank you, Sarkeesian, for clarifying, right? I think that helps Gonzalez also, absolutely. Okay, any other comments before we conclude on Buber? Um, good. All right, so that's, uh, so next time we're going to see how all of this applies to specifically romantic relationships, specifically marriage, right? We're going to see how we can save our marriages or our partnerships, right? Uh, by learning to uh, infuse our relationships with the IU relationship, right? Very often we're going to learn that our relationships go bad simply because the IU has disappeared. And the moment you reinsert the IU or you infuse your relationship with IU-ness, right, you can actually save your marriage. We're going to talk about that next time. Okay, great. So you guys can go. I'll stop the recording.